Do you want to live the abundant life? Deeper Life Bible Church invites you to our annual national convention beginning at 5 p.m. on Thursday, July 26th to Sunday, July 29th, 2018. The venue is Deeper Life Bible Church Convention Center in Kinston, North Carolina. The thief cometh not, but for to steal, kill, and destroy. But Christ has come to give you the abundant life. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do. The theme this year is The Abundant Life. Ministering, Pastor W.F. Kumi, Pastor Michael Dada, and other anointed ministers of God. Also ministering is the Glorious Voices Choir of Deeper Life Bible Church. Come and experience God in the abundance of His power. Come and experience the abundant life. Everybody said, I welcome you to our leaders' development session tonight in Jesus' name. And I pray that uh, the study tonight will enrich your heart, penetrate your life, and help you making decisions in your life that will lead you to something higher something greater and what the lord has for every one of us in jesus name let's pray together almighty god will bless your name tonight we thank you because you always gather us together here for a good purpose and we thank you for every leader brother and sister over here tonight and in all the various locations where your people are gathered, I'm asking tonight, Lord, you reveal yourself in a very distinct, definite way to everyone in Jesus' name. And we pray that the word will not be lost on anyone. We'll take it in. We'll work on it. We'll apply it in our lives. It will make us better leaders in Jesus' name. Amen. Confirm the word as we speak tonight. Amen. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. We're turning to 2 Chronicles chapter 35. And I'm reading the last session there or section there. Second Chronicles chapter 35, reading from verse 20. After all this, when Josiah had prepared the temple, Nico king of Egypt came up to fight against Kakemish by Euphrates. And Josiah went out against him. But he sent ambassadors to him, saying, what have I to do with thee, thou king of Judah? I came, I come not against thee this day, but against the house where we is I have war. For God commanded me to make haste, forbear, forbear thee from meddling with God, who is with me, that he destroyed thee not. Nevertheless, Josiah would not turn his face from him, but disguised himself that he might fight with him. And he hearkened not unto the words of Necho from the mouth of God, and came to fight in the valley of Megiddo. And the archers shot at King Josiah. And the king said, to his servants, help me away, for I am so wounded. His servants therefore took him out of that chariot and put him in the second chariot that he had. And they brought him to Jerusalem. And he died and was buried in one of the sepulchres of his father. And all Judah. And Jerusalem mourned for Josiah, and Jeremiah lamented for Josiah, 
and all the singing men and the singing women speak of Josiah in their lamentations to this day and made them an ordinance in Israel and behold the reaching in the lamentations as we look at those verses tonight we want to learn some words of wisdom how we need to live our lives plan our lives obviously from everything we have read in the other passages in second kings as well as second chronicles Josiah was a great king a good king a righteous king his reforms in Judah were not worthy hearing from the holy book the book of God he was convicted of the nation's sins the nation's transgressions and iniquities he went before the Lord when he heard the word of God and he led Judah to repentance led Judah to reform and reformation he led Judah to righteousness to revival and renewal there was relative peace and rest in the land there wasn't uh, much fighting and war and conflict he had rest he had peace in the land he had the singular privilege of the ben and the benefit of the ministry of faithful prophets sometimes we overlook all these things about the opportunities these kings had who helped them who counseled them who admonished them who taught them actually jeremiah that great prophet of god ministered at the time of josiah let's come to jeremiah chapter one i'm reading from verse one jeremiah chapter one verse one the words of jeremiah the son of hilkiah the priest that were in anathos in the land of benjamin to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah. You see that? Jeremiah ministered, Jeremiah prophesied, Jeremiah preached at the time of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the thirteenth year of his reign. It came also in the days of Jehoiakim, son, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, unto the end of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, unto the carrying away of Jerusalem, captive, um, captive in the fifth month. And so Jeremiah ministered and prophesied at the time of Josiah. There's another prophet. This prophet did not introduce himself at the very beginning, just went straight to his prophecy. But we know that he ministered at the time of Josiah, and his name is Habakkuk. Please come to Habakkuk. We're reading from chapter 1. Habakkuk chapter 1. And you'll see the concern of Habakkuk in verse 12. You'll see his concern for the holiness of God, for the purity of the word, and for righteousness in the nation. And such prophet Habakkuk ministered at the time of Josiah, look at verse 12, chapter 1. Are thou not, he's talking to God, are thou not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my holy one, we shall not die. O Lord, thou hast ordained them for judgment. That is the unbelievers, the heathen, the pagans, the sinful nations for judgment. And O mighty God, thou hast established them for correction. Look at verse 13. Thou art of purer eyes, not to behold evil, and thou canst not look on iniquity. That was the message of Habakkuk. And such a prophet ministered at the time of Josiah. Look at verse 14. And make his men as the fishes of the sea, as the creeping things that have no ruler over them. Uh, let's come to Zephaniah. Zephaniah was another prophet that ministered at the time of Josiah. Zephaniah, I'm reading from chapter 1. In Zephaniah chapter 1, reading from verse 1, the word of the Lord which came unto Zephaniah, the son of Cushai, 
the son of Gedaliah, the son of Amariah, the son of Hezekiah, in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah. Why we reading all this? For you to understand that uh, Josiah was not led be wretch of instruction be read to uh, not having revelation instruction from the men of God that lived in his time all these were available and they could counsel him but you know the decision he took it was a decision without any counseling without any instruction he went headlong without making use of the ministries available to counsel him to admonish him so that he finished his reign in a terrible way look at verse 2 I will utterly consume all things from off the land says the Lord I will consume man and beast I will consume the fowls of the heaven and the fishes of the sea and the stumbling blocks with the wicked I will cut off man from off the land says the Lord you understand this prophet was not a compromising prophet he was a, st he was a standing prophet that stood of the righteousness and holiness of God he says in verse 4 I will also stretch out my hand upon Judah and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem Jerusalem, I will cut off the remnant of Baal from this place and the name of Keshirim said with the priest in verse 5 and them that worship the host of heaven upon the housetops and them that worship and them that swear by the Lord and swear by Malcolm and them that turn back from the Lord and those that have not sought the Lord now inquired for him and so you have uh, uh, Josiah under these uh, prophets and of course uh, another one was there uh, that uh, they took the word of the Lord to him and then it appreciated for them uh, and uh, Josiah wept and then the prophetess said because you have humbled yourself in my sight when you have the word of God I'll not bring all these judgments in your time he, she he had great opportunities to have learned what he ought to learn and you know at that time as you look at Hosea chapter 12 Hosea chapter 12 at that time God raised up those prophets those great men and women of God to lead those kings and to help the nation to stand the way they ought to stand. We're looking at Hosea chapter 12, I read from verse 10 and verse 13. It says in chapter 12, verse 10, I have also spoken by the prophets and I have multiplied visions and used similitudes, look at this, by the ministry of the prophets those prophets at ministries ministries for the kings ministries for the people ministries that turned them to the lord that made them to remember the word of the lord look at verse 13 verse 13 and by a prophet the lord brought israel out of egypt and by a prophet was he preserved and so as we look at Joshua, uh, Josiah tonight and we look at his good reign and then we look at the final decision we're going to concentrate on this final decision that he took because the decision that led to his death premature death untimely death early death avoidable death that decision was taken without seeking counsel without seeking instruction without seeking the might of the lord as we have read this story together in the chapter 35 of second chronicles even the heathen king said what have i got to do with you king of judah i have not come this day to fight against you the lord sent me to this other one so don't meddle with this forbear and go back home and go and rest but Josiah would not listen. Let's look at Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Ecclesiastes chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 13. Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Reading from verse 13. It says, Better is a poor and a wise child than an old and foolish king who will no more be admonished. Well, Josh, Josiah was not that old, but his position made him number one in the nation. 
made him may be the eldest that is in course in the nation that people were looking up to but it says uh, it's better to be a wise child an ignorant child innocent child than a foolish king old king that will no more be admonished don't allow that to happen to you that because you have been in the house of god for a long time because you have been in the service of the lord for a long time admonition then passes off and uh, instruction passes off revelation passes off counseling passes off and it doesn't affect you anymore that's what brought the downfall of this uh, man josiah tonight we're looking at the message watchfulness and faithfulness in fighting the lord's battle watchfulness and faithfulness in fighting the lord's battle come to think about it there's no other battle to fight the only battle we're called to fight is the lord's battle and the only thing we're to contend for is what the lord has commanded we should contend for and we should not fight any other battle and as we're fighting the lord's battle there's need for watchfulness as we're fighting the lord's battle there is need for faithfulness i'm looking at uh, first samuel chapter 25 for you to understand the battles we fight ought to be the lord's battles the lord's battles in first samuel chapter 25 i'm reading from verse 28 for samuel chapter 25 verse 28 it says i pray thee forgive the trespass of an handmaid for the lord will certainly make my lord a sure house because my lord fighters the battles of the lord my lord fighteth that is david the battles of the lord and evil has not been found in thee all thy days register that in your mind that the battles were supposed to fight shall be battles of the lord only the battles of the lord we're coming to second chronicles chapter 20 verse 15. second chronicles chapter 20 and i'm reading here from verse 15 the lord's battles it tells us in second chronicles chapter 20 reading from verse 15 it says and he said how can ye all judah and ye inhabitants of uh, jerusalem and now king jehoshaphat thus says the lord unto you be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude for the battle is not yours tell me but god's is the lord's battle and so if you are going to fight at all and you must fight because it is the lord's battle but you watch and you make sure that you are faithful we're coming to deuteronomy chapter one deuteronomy chapter one i'm reading from verse 41 deuteronomy chapter one verse 41 fighting with watchfulness fighting with faithfulness and there are times when not to fight when god says don't fight you don't fight because after all it says battle and it says i don't want you to fight in that i don't want you to contend for that look at Deuteronomy chapter 1 verse 41 then he answered and said unto me we have sinned against the Lord we will go up and fight according to all that the Lord our God commanded us and when he had guarded on every man his weapons of war he were ready to go up into the hill and the Lord said unto me say unto them go not up neither fight for i am not among you lest he be smitten before your enemies there are times when the lord tells us don't fight don't put your hand there i'll take care of that i'll do it myself and when he says not to fight that's it not to fight but look at verse 43 so i speak unto you and ye would not hear but rebelled against the commandment of the lord and went presumptuously up into the hill and the amorites which dwelt in the mountain came out against you and chased you as bees do and destroyed you in seer even unto Hormon. 
And he returned and wept before the Lord, but the Lord will not hearken to your voice, nor give ear unto you. Because he didn't understand, if you're going to fight the Lord's battle, get his counseling, get his admonition, get his instruction, and know his mind, and know what he actually wants. Otherwise, you might find that you are fighting against God himself. We're coming to Acts of the Apostles chapter 5. Acts of the Apostles chapter 5, and I read from verse 34. Acts of the Apostles chapter 5, verse 34. Then stood there up one in the council, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a doctor of the law, had a reputation among all the people, and commanded to put the apostles forth a little, a little space. And he said unto them, Ye men of Israel, Take heed to yourselves what she intend to do as touching these men. For before these days, then he began to narrate some things unto them. And let's uh, go down to verse uh, 38. And now I say unto you, refrain from these men and let them alone. For if this counsel or this work be of men, it will come to naught. You don't have to fight in this thing. Gamaliel said, if it's not of God, it will fizzle out. It will die by itself. It will go by itself. But in verse 39, if it be of God, ye cannot overthrow it, lest happily ye be found even to fight against God. That is, if we say, no, this is a religion. We are going to preserve the religion. And all these apostles or disciples, whatever they call themselves, roaming about and then they fill Jerusalem with their doctrine. We are going to smash it. We are going to cancel it. Gamaliel said, you know what? It's either the thing is of God or it's not of God. Anything we consider in church, anything we consider in religion, it's either of God or it's not of God. If it is not of God, it will die. It will not have the support of heaven. It will not have the support of the Almighty God. If it be of God and you fight against it, ye cannot overthrow it, lest happily ye be found even to fight against God. Look at verse 40. And to him they agreed. And to him they agreed. We're looking at Acts of the Apostles chapter 23 verse 9. Acts of the Apostles chapter 23 verse 9 And there arose, there arose a great cry And the scribes that were of the Pharisees A patch arose and the strove saying We find no evil in this man But if his spirit or an angel has spoken to him Let us not fight against God If a spirit has spoken to him if the Holy Ghost has spoken to him, if the angels have spoken to him, by the revelation that we don't have any knowledge of, let us not fight against God. Once again, I want to remind you, we're looking at fighting the Lord's battles, and we're looking at it, watchfulness and faithfulness in fighting the Lord's battles. Three things we're looking at. Number one, the supreme demand of not fighting without spiritual guidance the supreme demand god himself has made the demand that before you fight you must have spiritual guidance the supreme demand of not fighting without spiritual guidance point number two the sacred duty of faithfulness with strengthening grace as we see the fight that he has called us to fight, as we see the battle, he pushes us into himself. We need grace, the grace that strengthens. And we have this sacred duty of faithfulness with that strengthening grace. The sacred duty of faithfulness with strengthening grace. Point number three, our sacrificial devotion in fighting for scriptural godliness. Our sacrificial devotion, a sacrificial consecration, a sacrificial discipline, a sacrificial consecration in fighting for scriptural godliness. There's our sacrificial devotion 
in fighting for scriptural godliness. We we'll come to point number one. Did you write down number one? Or did you write down? The supreme demand of not fighting without spiritual guidance. Look at Numbers chapter 27. Numbers chapter 27. Here is what had been written down before Josiah was born. Here is what was written down even from the time of Moses. And since the book of Moses was brought to him and the book of the law was brought to him, he should have noticed they should have read this. And when we read the word of God, we take note of what we are reading and we learn from what we are reading and we plan our lives and we plan our activities and we plan our responsibilities. We plan all the endeavors according to the word. Look at Numbers chapter 27 reading from verse 21 Numbers 27 verse 21 and he shall stand before Eleazar the priest who shall ask counsel for him is a king is not a prophet therefore another person will ask counsel for him is a leader but he doesn't have an inside knowledge of the mind of God of the will of God therefore he shall ask counsel for him after the judgment of Urim before the Lord at his word shall he go out is going out to war is going out to fight the lost battle it has at the word of revelation at the word of counsel instruction it will go out at his word they shall come in both he and all the children of Israel with him even all the congregation that means uh, even the members of the church they are not left out leadership we should seek counseling and the membership should seek counseling or want to do this we just don't say okay I know what to do I think uh, this is what you do now in fighting the battle of the Lord no you will ask counsel from the mouth of the Lord and uh, let's see the quality of life of uh, this uh, great king uh, the, uh, the good king uh, David we're looking at first Samuel chapter 23 for Samuel chapter 23 and I'm reading from verse 1 for Samuel chapter 23 verse 1 then they told David saying behold the Philistines fight against Caleb and they rob the threshing floors and now you understand David was a warrior and David was a champion David was a conqueror he was the one earlier than this that defeated and killed the Goliath the champion of the Philistines and now the Philistines came he didn't say okay I know what to do I'll take them on again I'm going to fight this again look at verse 2 therefore David inquired of the Lord. Therefore, David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go and smite these Philistines? And the Lord said unto David, Go and smite the Philistines and save Caleb. You see the attitude and you see the commitment of David. He knew there is the supreme demand from the Almighty. You are going to fight, wait, as counsel. As the revelation from God is the supreme demand of not fighting you know, until you have spiritual guidance. Look at verse 4. In verse 4, then David inquired of the Lord yet again. Because, you know, some people said, we have a problem here. And are we going over there to fight again? I said, okay, let me go and cross-check. Let me understand whether this is going to be affirmed by the Lord. Then David inquired of the Lord yet again. And the Lord answered him and said, Arise, go down to Caleb, for I will deliver the Philistines into thine hand. Uh, that, that's uh, what uh, Josiah should have done. You want to go and fight against uh, that's, the man is warning you. And the man is saying, I don't have any trouble with you. I'm not fighting with you. The Lord has sent me to this place to fight against them. And then Josiah disguised himself. I want to fight by all means. He had some army and the army is not doing anything. And just to keep the army active, we must go out and fight. We don't say go out and fight just to keep somebody, some people active. He's got some weapons of war. And those weapons of war are just lying fallow and they're not being used. And he says, I'm going to test all these the weapons of war we must go out to fight Josiah we don't do that that is dangerous we don't go into battle just because we want the weapons of war we have in our in our whatever uh, to, uh, to to be used look at verse 9 in verse 9 
And David said, uh, that is uh, chapter 23, this same chapter 23, I'm reading from verse 9. Uh, and David knew that uh, Saul secretly practiced mischief against him. And he said to Abatha, the priest, bring hither the effort. And then David said, O Lord God of Israel, thy servant has certainly heard that Saul seeketh to come to Caleb and to destroy the city because of me for my sake. Look at verse 11. Will the men of Caleb deliver me up into their hands? Will Saul come down as thy servant has said, O Lord God of Israel, I beseech thee, tell me, tell me, tell thy servant. I need information. I need revelation. I don't want to be walking like a blind man. I don't want to be operating like a blind king. I need direction. I need counseling. And the Lord said, he will come down. Verse 12. Then said David, Will the men of Caleb deliver me and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, They will deliver thee up. He sought revelation and he wanted to understand. Let's come to chapter 30. I'm looking at 1 uh, Samuel chapter 30 and I'm reading from verse 6. 1 Samuel chapter 30, reading from verse 6. And David was greatly distressed uh, for the people spake of stoning him because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord is God. What had happened here is that the enemies came and they burnt the city. And he took all the spots and he took their wives and he took all their children, took everyone away. And when they came back, they saw the devastation, the destruction. And those men of war, warriors, they began to cry. And even David wept until he had no power to weep anymore. It was discouraged and the people even wanted to stone him. He encouraged himself in the Lord. I think you'll say it's natural to go after those people. Do you have to pray to go after those people and to go and fight in the battle? Because we must recover them. We don't need, we don't, we cannot waste time now uh, praying and seeking counsel. No, not David. We have to seek counsel if we're going to fight the Lord's battle. Yes, they've taken our property away. They've taken our wives away. They've taken our children away. What are we going to do? How are we going to do it? Look at verse 7. And David said to Abiathar, the priest, Abimelech's, uh, Ahimelech's uh, son, I pray thee, bring me hither the effort. And Abiathar brought hither the effort unto David. And David inquired at the Lord. And David inquired at the Lord. You want to fight the battle of the Lord? Inquire, find out, seek counseling. He inquired of the Lord, shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he, say, he answered him, pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them and without fail recover all. I pray you'll recover all. Second Samuel chapter 5, Second Samuel chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 19. Second Samuel chapter 5, verse 19. And David inquired of the Lord. What a good quality. Hey, Josiah, I thought, uh, you know, you are following the life of David, the rule of David. I thought, uh, you know, you are compared. You know that David was the standard. Because after David had ruled, except for the one uh, terrible thing that he did for which he was punished, God said, he obeyed me. I found a man after my own heart and if you are following David follow him fully he did right according to what his father David had done follow this as well if you're going to fight in the battle of the Lord if you're going to fight any kind of a fighting go back to God second Samuel chapter 5 verse 19 and the Lord inquired and did and David inquired of the Lord saying shall I go up to the Philistines, will thou deliver them into my hand? And the Lord said unto David, Go up, for I will doubtless deliver the Philistines into thine hand. First Kings chapter 12, 
In First Kings chapter 12, I'm reading from verse 22. First Kings chapter 12, and we're looking at verse 22. It says in verse 22, But the word of the Lord came unto Shemaiah, the man of God, saying, Speak unto Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, king of Judah, unto all the house of Judah and Benjamin, and to the remnant of the people, saying, Thus says the Lord, Ye shall not go up nor fight against your brethren, the children of Israel. We don't fight every time. We don't fight every time. Because we need to wait for the Lord. What's the Lord saying? Don't take the word out of the hand of the Lord. Don't take your activity out of the hand of the Lord. The Lord needs to speak and the Lord needs to direct. That was the major mistake and the major fault and the sin that made Josh and Josiah to die prematurely and to die an untimely death and to die an avoidable death it says ye shall not go up nor fight against your brethren the children of israel return every man to his house for this thing is from me i know about it all i know what's happening and you are not supposed to fight in this battle they hearkened therefore to the word of the lord and they returned to depart according to the word of the lord according to the word of the lord but you've seen the case of uh, josiah he will not return he will not stop he still he could make amends you've come and then the man is saying who are you why are you coming to fight? What's your problem here? What's your concern here? I'm not saying to you. I'm saying to this other side, young man, go back home. You have a lot to think about. Your reformation, continue with your reformation. Continue with your revival. Continue with the great work you're doing. You have a great work you're doing. You have a good record already. Therefore, don't meddle with this. But he disguised himself. And we're looking at uh, Proverbs chapter 26. Proverbs chapter 26, reading from verse 17. Proverbs 26, verse 17. He that passeth by, like Josiah was passing by, and he saw that uh, Nekov uh, was going to fight against uh, this other king, and then he that passeth by a meddless with strife not belonging to him. He made us with strife, with war, with battle that does not belong to him. It's like one that taketh a dog by the ears. You won't be able to hold the ears firm, and the ears are not the major parts of the body of the dog. And the dog will obviously want to bite you and you might sustain injury that you cannot be free from, heal from. We're looking at Psalm 32. Psalm 32. I read from verse 8. Psalm 32. We're reading from verse 8. I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I saw the church will say, Amen. Amen. The Lord says, He'll instruct us. Why don't we go to Him for instruction? He says, Don't just live your life like a blind man, beating about the bush, touch this, turn this, go here, go there. No directives from the Lord, no instruction from the Lord, no conviction in the heart that God ordered me to do this. I can tell you the time, I can tell you the hour, I can tell you the place where God said, go this way. Because he said, I will instruct you, I will teach you in the way thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eyes. I pray will guide you. I pray will lead you. I pray will not just be pushing here, pulling this one and touching this and touching that without God's guidance, fighting battles that do not belong to us. He wants us to be guided in everything that we do. We're looking at Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3, I read from verse 5. Proverbs chapter 3 verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. 
lean not unto thine own understanding. You see, since the time of praying through to know God's will in marriage, the many people that have not prayed through on any other thing. If they're going to get married, oh Lord, lead me, oh Lord, guide me. Who is the person? And they pray and they pray and they seek counseling and they look at the word of God and they bury themselves in the word of God and they pray and they say, Lord, I need your guidance. And then the day came. And in one way or the other, the Lord led and they said, I know that I know. You can question me. I know that I know. You can dribble me. I know that I know that this is the will of God for me. Since that time, they now depend upon their own understanding. Anything they want to do, any decision they want to take, any act they want to carry out, they're not asking from the Lord. They're not seeing anything from the Lord. But it says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thy own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. He shall direct thy paths. Jeremiah chapter 10, I'm reading from verse 23. Jeremiah chapter 10, we're reading from verse 23. He wants us to seek guidance. You want to do anything, seek guidance. You want to go somewhere, seek guidance. It's not only in marriage. You want to travel, seek guidance. You want to get involved in something, seek guidance. And you're fighting in the Lord's battle. Hey, here is activity. Here is a problem. Here is something. Before you launch into it, because so and so is doing it, so and so is doing it, that doesn't guarantee that it is the will of God. Seek guidance from the Lord. Jeremiah chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 23. Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 23. Oh Lord, I know. Lord, I know. Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. The path of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. You say, it is not in man. Whether it's a king, or is an ordinary person is not in the hand of the man to direct himself good men and good women good kings and good leaders are not immune from defeat danger or even death if major decisions of life and warfare are taken without god and his guidance Josiah was a good king a righteous king a reforming king. He was a great reformer. But then, uh, that did not give immunity to, for defeat. Immunity to death. Because you still must seek the will of God. Josiah had an army. He wanted to engage by all means. The army is just there. And they're not fighting any battle. And this is a chance to fight a battle. They must be engaged in fighting. He had weapons of war. He was determined to use. I don't care whether this is the will of God or not, but look at all the skill we have, look at all the strength we have, look at all the energy we have. There must be a way of expending this energy and putting, and this is battle, and this is a chance for us. No, Josiah, we don't live like that. He was warned, but rather than heed the warning, he disguised himself to fight. You know the story? And he died. He rushed and he hurried to his death. Some people hurry to their ruin, not seeking the will of God, not seeking the mind of God, not thinking of the consequence of their action. There is something that drives them from within. There is a spirit that pushes them almost irresistibly. You know, that's why the Lord has provided sanctification for us. You know what sanctification does? Sanctification calms us down. The thing that is, uh, you know, stop me on the inside, and the thing that is waging war on the inside, and the thing that is pushing and driving on the inside, sanctification comes us down. Sanctification cools the inner heat. That's the inner heat. It's like, uh, you know, the lead should blow up. 
it's like I should not be standing here I should not be staying here I need to get running I need to get something done there's a battle going on there and I'm ready and I'm courageous and I want to go and fight sanctification cools the inner heat sanctification quietens the inward restlessness there's restlessness in the man naturally and he wants to go there he wants to go there he wants to turn everything around there without being led by the lord sanctification quietens the inner restlessness sanctification steals the righteous term of impatience impatience you know we're impatient about everything i mean get on let's do something let's be active and uh, you know whether it is right or wrong let's get something done Sanctification will steal the righteous term of impatience. Sanctification uproots the nature of carnal warfare. Sanctification uproots the nature of carnal warfare. We're coming to point number two, the sacred duty of faithfulness with strengthening grace. We're looking at Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, I read from verse 13. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, we're reading from verse 13. It says in verse 13, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man. We have a duty. We have an assignment, a sacred duty, a spiritual responsibility, a soul-saving assignment. And you understand, no part of the assignment the Lord has given us, no part of the sacred duty can be done with carnal weapon. We cannot carry out the assignment, the duty, the responsibility with carnal weapon. Yes, a duty. Yes, an assignment. Yes, a responsibility. Yes, something, a demand from God that we have to do this in life. Even when there's a battle to fight. Yes, we need to fight this battle. Yet, we cannot use carnal weapons. Swords and spears will not fight in the New Testament duty the Lord has given us. Anger and slander cannot be used in the great duty the Lord has given New Testament believers wrath and indignation we cannot choose wrath and indignation to carry out the watch of God because it's a ministry of love, it's a ministry of compassion, it's a ministry of mercy, it's a ministry of salvation, it's a ministry of recalling and rescuing the perishing. And we cannot choose the weapon of wrath and indignation. We cannot choose the weapon of oppression and aggression oppression and aggression you know something boiling from within something that is you know instigating and uh, making us to pound some people and beat people down and uh, crush them because we want this to be achieved we cannot do the kingdom work like that aggression and oppression will not accomplish the work of God in the New Testament. Hold hostility and antagonism. We cannot choose those weapons. They may do that in the world because they do not know anything better. But in the kingdom of God, the weapons we use cannot be hostility and antagonism to achieve a purpose and to achieve a goal. And we're driving at something. We cannot choose division and discord. It will not accomplish the work the Lord has given us to do. Strive and sedition cannot be the weapons we use in carrying out the great duty and the sacred duty that God has given us. Our strength is love, heavenly love. Our strength is loving the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. And loving believers as Christ has loved you. And loving your neighbors as yourself. Our strength is faith, unwavering faith. Therefore, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith he shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Our strength is sacrifice. Sacrifice, self-denial. Sacrifice, self-effacing sacrifice. That's how we fight the battle of the Lord in the New Testament our strength is prayer prevailing prayer 
the prayer of faith that moves the mountain, the mountains before us, and the difficulties before us how to fight the battle of the Lord in the New Testament. Love, faith, sacrifice, prayer, power, Holy Ghost power. You're saved. You're sanctified. You're filled with the Holy Ghost. That's the weapon. You shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth. Our weapon is the Word. That is the inspired Word, the supernatural Word of God. It is the Word that brings us the power. We we'll speak the Word. Even when temptation comes from Satan, we we'll say, it is written and when there's any confusion and when there's anything to iron out it is reaching it is the word and then it is the grace of God the strengthening grace of God that's how we win in the battle that the Lord has given us to fight we're coming to Hebrews chapter 12 Hebrews chapter 12 I'm reading from verse 28 Hebrews Chapter 12, verse 28. It says, Wherefore, we receive in a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have grace. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. It says, Let us have grace. That's how we serve the Lord. And we have this love. And we love all people. And we love them. We don't want them to perish. And because of that love, we're bringing them into the kingdom. Let's have grace to do that. Look at it from verse 1. That is Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, you know the weapon he used? He used the weapon of love. You know the weapon he used? He used the weapon of prayer. You know the weapon he used? He used the weapon of faith. He used the weapon of sacrifice. He laid himself down. He used the weapon of power. He used the weapon of the word. It is written and was full of grace and full of truth. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. And he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God for consider him who endured that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds ye have not yet resisted unto blood striving against sin striving against sin and then we come to second Corinthians chapter 6 second Corinthians chapter 6 the sacred duty of faithfulness was strengthening grace, strengthening grace. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, reading here from verse 1, We then, as workers together with him, beseech you also that she receive not the grace of God in vain. Make use of that grace. Make use of that grace. Don't just leave that grace behind and then carry on self-effort, self-management and, uh, you know, just dabble into this and into that. We beseech you as workers together with God that you do not receive the grace of God in vain. For saith he, he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted and in the day of salvation have I so called supported you, sustained you. Behold now is the accepted time. Behold now is the day of salvation. Giving no offense in any sin that the ministry be not blamed. But in all things, approving ourselves as the ministers of God in much patience and afflictions and necessities and in distresses. It emphasizes again the grace of God. You're fighting the battle of the Lord. Fight it with the grace of God. You're doing an assigned duty, a sacred duty. Do it with the grace of God. It tells us in Galatians chapter 1 verse 6. Galatians chapter 1 verse 6. It says, I, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Unto another gospel, 
which is which is not another but there be some that trouble you and will pervert the gospel of Christ when we shift away from love in fighting the battles of the Lord this perversion when we shift away from faith and total dependence upon the Lord reliance on the Lord this perversion when we shift away from denying ourselves from sacrificing and from laying everything on the altar when we exalt self we're perverting the gospel when there's no more prayer when we're not praying to solve our problems we're not praying to get things ironed out we're not depending upon God to see us through this perversion of the work the Lord has given us when we're not depending on the power of the Holy Ghost and we're depending on the power of self the power of the natural canal self where we're perverting the way we ought to do the work of God when we're not relying on the word of God when we're not finding out what does the Bible say what does what, what does God say in this situation in a battle like this in a challenge like this in conflict like this in resolutions like this what as the word of God say when we're not consulting the word of God again we're perverting the gospel and when there's no grace when there's no grace we don't need grace we just say you know move on and get this done and get that done and we're going to get the work of God we strategize and then we put this one there put this one there and we think our, and use our brain and grace is absent we're perverting the work of God look at verse 8 but though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which were preached unto you let him be accursed as was said before so say I now again if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which ye have received let him be accursed for do I now persuade men or God or do I seek to please men if I yet pleased men I should not be the servant of Christ he wants us to major on the grace of God and look at uh, look at uh, sec uh, second chapter that is Galatians chapter 2 I'm reading from verse 20 Galatians chapter 2 verse 20 I am crucified with Christ self must be crucified the Adamic nature must be crucified. The old man must be crucified. The me, the I, standing in firm and standing erect, and this is what I will do. The bragging must be crucified. The pride must be crucified. The self-centeredness must be crucified. If we're going to do the work of God acceptably, if we're gospel people if we're gracious people if we're people who are on our way to heaven it says i am crucified with christ nevertheless i live yet not i but christ liveth in me and the life which i now live in the flesh i live by the face of the son of god who loved me and gave himself for me i pray every one of us will come back to the grace of god I said we'll come back to the grace of God and will not uh, make a ruin of our lives by abandoning the grace of God. Look at Jude chapter 1. Jude is as only one chapter. I'm reading here from verse 4. It says in Jude verse 4, For there are certain men crept in unawares. Certain men crept in unawares we're not sure of their salvation we're not sure of their holiness experience we're not sure of the gracious life we're not sure of they being filled with love we're not sure of they uh, being filled with faith we're not sure of their willingness to sacrifice we're not sure of their consecration they crept in unawares we're not sure of their prayer life we're not sure of their dependence upon the lord we're not sure of their being filled and saturated and empowered and endued and baptized in the holy ghost we're not sure of the word of god abiding in them we're not sure of the grace of god instigating them influencing them and helping them for there are certain men crept in on awares who were before of old ordained unto this condemnation ungodly men turning the grace of our God turning the grace of our God turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only true, true the only Lord God and our Savior Jesus Christ I will therefore put you in remembrance 
though ye once knew this, how that the Lord having saved the people out of the land of Egypt after what destroyed them that believed not. The people did not continue in love. They did not continue relying on God. They did not continue in faith. They did not continue in prayer. They did not continue the word of God. He destroyed them. And the angels, verse 6, which led, which kept not their first estate, but led their own habitation he has reserved in everlasting chase under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah, the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Likewise, also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, they don't have to pray, defile the flesh, they don't have to seek the will of God in doing anything, they defile the flesh and they despise dominion, they speak evil of dignities. Yet Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, does not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. But these speak evil of those things which they know not, but what they know naturally as brute beasts in those things, they corrupt themselves. Want to them. They for they have gone in the way of Cain. They have run, they have run greedily after the error of Balaam for reward and perished in the gain saying of Corinth. These are sports in your feast of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear clouds they are without water carried about of winds and trees whose fruits withereth without fruit twice dead plucked up by the roads raging waves of the sea roaming and uh, foaming out their own shame wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness for how long forever i pray that will not be your lord did I hear an amen? amen? We're going to remain in the grace of God. It tells us in uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, 2 Peter chapter 3, and we're reading from verse 17 and verse 18. 2 Peter chapter 3, reading from verses 17 and 18. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware. Let's see also be led away with the error of the wicked fall from your own steadfastness but grow in grace but can you say that and in what in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ you know if we're going to do the work of God successfully we must have grace, the grace of God. And the more the responsibility, the greater the duty, and the greater the assignment, the greater the grace of God in our lives. But if we add grace at the point of being born again, and now we become workers, not only that leaders, not only that pastors, not only that overseers, if we don't have the same grace we had at the beginning, and we don't have greater grace, higher grace than we had at that time, and we don't have prayer life like we had at that time, and we don't have the love we had at that time, we don't have the humility we had at that time, with greater responsibility and greater duty, and we have less, uh, less love and less less prayer and less faith and less grace and less uh, ointment and less power, less unction in our lives. Are we going to really do the work of God? That's why it says grow in grace. We're going to grow in grace. And in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to Him be glory in your life, glory in your ministry, glory in your place of work, both now and forevermore. Amen. Let's come now to point number three, our sacrificial devotion in fighting 
this script for scriptural godliness our sacrificial devotion in fighting for scriptural godliness yes what to fight what kind of fight what are we fighting for and let's look at it in first timothy chapter 6 first timothy chapter 6 and i'm reading from verse 11 first timothy chapter 6 reading from verse 11 this is a fight he has called us to it's not fighting philistines now it's not fighting a political battle it's not fighting a tribe it's not fighting a religion it's not fighting human beings look at the fight we're called to it tells us in first timothy chapter 6 verse 11 but thou O man of god O woman of god any man of god in the house today I said any woman of God in the house today it says but thou O man of God flee these things and follow after righteousness godliness faith love patience meekness tell me verse 12 tell me out aloud say that in unity together fight the good fight of faith if a sort of unbelief that's not a good fight out of hatred that's not a good fight out of pride that's not a good fight out of carnal comparison i can do that too i can go there too i can defeat that too that's not a good fight a good fight of faith you're fighting to rescue the perishing and to call sinners out of their sins and bring them into the kingdom of God. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Wherefore, whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. We're coming to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I'm reading from verse 24. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 we're reading from verse 24 know ye not that they which run in a race run all but one receiveth the prize so run that she may obtain and every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate is self-controlled is under control in all things now they do each obtain a corruptible crown but we an incorruptible i therefore so run not as uncertainly and uh, so fight i so fight i so fight i not as one that beateth the air but i keep my body under what does that mean i keep my tongue under I keep whatever might be boiling on the inside, galloping on the inside, and striving on the inside, wanting a driver on the inside. I keep that under. I conquer myself first before I go to conquer on the battlefield for the Lord. But I keep my body under and bring it into subjection, lest by any means, when I have preached unto others, I myself should be a cast away. You will not be a cast away. We're looking at Galatians chapter 2, Galatians chapter 2, and we're reading from verse 4. Galatians chapter 2, verse 4. The fight of faith, what the Lord has called us to, the duty, the responsibility the Lord has called us to. He tells us in Galatians chapter 2, verse 4, it says, And that because of false brethren, unawares brought in, who came in privately, privileged to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. That is, bring us into their own ideology, bring us into their own tradition, bring us into the law of Moses, and bring us into that which has been abolished. They want to take us away from the freedom we have in Christ, liberty we have in Christ, the grace of God we have in Christ. They want to take us away from the real work of evangelization the Lord has put in our hands, and they want to bring us into bondage under their control. It says to whom we gave a place by subjection no not for an hour that's it that we're not going to come under bondage you'll not come under bondage anymore and it says that the truth of the gospel might continue with you the truth of the gospel the truth of real salvation and the truth of real sanctification and the truth of holy ghost baptism and the truth of 
that is revealed the whole counsel of God might remain with you I pray that this word will remain with every one of us in Jesus name I'm losing some amen there First Timothy, First Timothy chapter 1, First Timothy chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 18. First Timothy chapter 1, and we're reading from verse 18. It says in verse 18, this church I commit unto this son, Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare a good warfare that is fighting out to preserve the doctrines of the word of God fighting to preserve salvation pure and simple and sincere without any infiltration of any evil sin holding faith in verse 19 and a good conscience whilst which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck of whom is Hermanius and Alexander whom I have delivered unto Satan that they might learn not to blaspheme. Welcome to chapter 4, 1 Timothy chapter 4. I read from verse 6. 1 Timothy chapter 4, reading from verse 6. It tells us in verse 6, If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine good doctrine whereunto thou hast attained look at verse 15 meditate upon these things give thyself wholly to them all the words we're hearing all the training the Lord is giving us on Saturday, all the training the Lord is giving us, the development on Tuesday, all the messages we're hearing from the Word of God at the Monday study, and then on a Sunday and on Thursday, meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them, because that is what will help us to actually do the work of God acceptably, being filled with the love of God and having faith in God and having sacrifice and having a life for praying that will solve our problems, we move our mountains by prayer and having the power of the Holy Ghost in our lives, having the word, the word going out from us because we have learned the word and we make use of the word when we need to make use of that word to conquer in, in all the battles of our lives and the grace of God, the sustaining grace of God in our lives that thy prophet him may appear unto all, take it unto thyself and unto the doctrine, Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. You know, if the people who are hearing you are no more thinking of salvation, if the people who are hearing us are no more thinking of holiness without which no man shall save the Lord, if their minds are diverted to another theme, if their minds are diverted to another issue, another consideration, and they're not thinking of their salvation, they're not thinking of except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God and the newcomers who are coming to the church and the backsliders who are in the church, they are not thinking about their restoration, all they are thinking about is this area and this area which has nothing to do with their salvation, then we are not actually carrying out the ministry and the duty the Lord has called us to take it unto thyself and unto the doctrine continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that Hear thee. Look at Second Timothy chapter one, verse thirteen. Second Timothy chapter one, verse thirteen. Hold fast the form of sound word which thou hast learnt of me. Everything you have had, hold it fast. Think over it. Meditate on it. Turn it around, ruminate, and make sure that you apply it to your life. Hold fast the form of sound words. Let nothing divert your attention from that form of sound word. Let nothing divert your mind, your soul, your heart. This is what will make us profit in the ministry. Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. That good thing, salvation, that good thing, sanctification, that good thing, Holy Ghost baptism, that good thing, mountain of in faith, that good thing, the promises of God, that good thing, the whole counsel of God, that good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwells in us. I pray you'll keep it. Chapter 2. 
second timothy chapter 2 reading from verse 1 that therefore my son be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things which thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness. There are difficulties, for example, getting here for a Tuesday development uh, session. Uh, there are difficulties on the road. There are holdups on the road. There are challenges on the road. But as we make the effort, we endure hardness, we endure difficulty. We're not going to give priority to difficulties and say because of that difficulty, then we cannot come on Tuesday. Because of that challenge, then we cannot have everything we ought to have. Difficulties are always there. And people are going through through those difficulties and they're getting to the market difficulties are always there and the people are getting to the places they need to get to the same thing if the work of God is number one if our training our development is essential and important to us whatever challenge and whatever difficulty we're going to endure I said we're going to endure I'm waiting for a good good amen now therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ no man that worries entangleth himself with the affairs of this life that she may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier welcome to chapter 4 I'm reading from verse 1 For Second Timothy chapter 4 I'm reading here from verse 1 it tells us in verse 1 I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom preach the word preach the word preach the word people would like you to tell stories people would like you to uh, think of other things and uh, to give this and give that and they're saying this is what we need now that's what we need now but what we need is the word preach the word be instant in season out of season reprove rebuke exhort without long suffering and doctrine for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables but watch thou in all things you will watch you watch over your soul you are going to watch you watch over the ministry you are going to watch you watch over the people because the lord has made you watch men to take care of the people and to get the backsliders restored and to get the righteous saints of god standing firm and to get sinners convicted and run into the to, to calvary that they will be say watch thou in all things endure afflictions do the work of an evangelist make full proof of thy ministry for i am now ready to be offered and the time of my departure is at hand I have fought a good fight I pray you'll be able to say that at the end of your ministry at the end of your life I have fought a good fight I have finished my course I have kept the faith you will keep the faith henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me at that day and not only not to me only but unto all them that also that love is appearing look at verse 18 and the Lord somebody there and the Lord somebody there read after me and the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his everlasting kingdom to whom be glory forever and ever amen, amen. read it for yourself one two three go and the whole church said the Lord will deliver you from every evil work. The Lord will preserve you unto his heavenly kingdom. What then are we to do? And how are we to do it? Jude, I'm looking at Jude, having only one chapter, verse 3, beloved. When I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful, it was necessary 
it was compulsory that for me to write unto you and to exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Don't forget that. Salvation, sanctification, holiness without which no man shall save the Lord, the power of the Holy Ghost on purified, sanctified souls and hearts, and the gifts of the Spirit, one man, one wife. Until this doors part, and evangelism go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Concentrate on the whole counsel of God, earnestly contending for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. How do you do that? To earnestly contend for the faith, the whole counsel of God. Number one, you preach the truth faithfully, fully, forcefully, convincingly. You preach the word. You're not missing words. You're not afraid of your congregation. And you preach that word fully, faithfully, fearlessly, forcefully, convincingly. Number two, you earnestly contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints by confronting false doctrine. Any false doctrine flying around in your locality, in your local government, any false doctrine that they're peddling, they're disputing this and disputing that, you will not allow that to affect your congregation. You confront false doctrine and you have no fellowship with the teachers of false doctrine. Number three, you'll be as aggressive in spreading the truth. The whole truth, as false prophets are, is spreading their error. Those people that are spreading error, they wake up early in the morning and they, wait, they go everywhere and they are spreading and spreading and spreading. And they use literature and they use the social media and they use everything. You know, you'll be as aggressive in spreading the truth as they are in spreading error. Number four, you charge all leaders, you charge all workers that they teach no other doctrine. That they concentrate on the doctrine that saves, on the word of God that saves. Number five, you sever all relationships with perpetrators of error and evil. You're not going to befriend them. You're not going to allow your congregation seeing you befriending the people that are perpetrating error, inviting them to hear the word of God, that's all right. Inviting them to come and share in the word that we're receiving, that's all right. But apart from that, you know, mingling with them, meddling with them, associating with them, and fraternizing with them, you suffer all relationships with uh, per perpetrators of evil and error. Number six, you support faithful pastors who teach the whole counsel of God without fear, without favor. You lay everything down, you can lay it down, and you have, you have active support. You are proactive about it. And then you'll be supporting them, joining hands together to emphasize the truth that takes us to heaven. Number seven, you train and you involve faithful teachers who will be so sound that they will teach effectively and live holy without hypocrisy and without pretense. Once again in Jude, verse 3, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that you should earnestly, fervently, wholeheartedly, seriously, and zealously contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. That's the calling the Lord has given us. That's the commission the Lord has given us. And that is the duty the Lord has given us. You will do it. I will do it. And as we do it faithfully, the Lord will reward us. Even in this life, the Lord will reward you. In the life to come, the Lord will reward you as well. Revelation chapter 2, Revelation chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 8. Revelation chapter 2, verse 8. And unto the angel of the church in manner, write, These things says the first and the last, which was, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, 
but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Fear not. It's only a little bit of a discomfort for the body. Fear not. It's only a little bit of a, you know, maybe suffering. Fear not. Jesus went to the cross and died for us. And that salvation he has provided, we must let everybody know. Don't let fear keep you back from faithfulness. Fear not. Those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that she may be tried, and you shall have tribulation only 10 days, a short time, less than two weeks, only 10 days out of life, out of all all the 70 years, 80 years, 90 years, 100 years you are going to spend on earth, 10 days is nothing. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. Any amen coming from the house? Amen. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. He that overcometh, he that overcometh, not the people that chicken out, not the people who are weak need, not the people that don't have any conviction, not the people that don't have any backbone. He that overcometh shall not be hurt in a second death. And then he tells us in chapter 3, chapter 3 of Revelation, I'm reading here from verse 7 to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, right? This thing says he that is holy, he that is true, he that has the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, that's the open door before you. Doors of ministry before you. Doors of opportunity before you. And he shutteth and no man openeth, I know thy walls. Behold, I have set before thee an open door. I have set before thee an open door. And no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my faith. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews, and are not, and but do lie. Behold, I will make them come and worship before thy feet. And to know that I have loved thee. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation we shall come upon the whole world to try them that dwell on the earth behold i come quickly behold i come quickly hold that fast which thou hast that no man take thy crown you are going to wear a crown you are going to have reward nobody will take your crown in jesus name him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my, from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. Anybody have any ears to hear over there? Have you heard? I said, have you heard? And are you going to obey the word of God? Fight the good fight of faith. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. Commit ourselves to the Lord in prayer. Remember, 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 you don't fight any battle that God is not sending you to fight. And you don't uh, fight any battle without spiritual guidance. Ask the Lord, ask the Lord, have you been careless in your personal life? Have you been careless in uh, seeking the face of the Lord? Have you been careless in uh, seeking uh, the will of God and guidance? Tell the Lord, tell the Lord, oh Lord, I'm sorry. Don't be like uh, jo 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 Josiah uh, that uh, just went out and then he lost his life unnecessarily. Don't die a premature death. Open your mouth and talk to him and say, Lord, here am I. Help me. Let this word sink deep in your heart and lay by this word and the Lord himself will make use of you as a mighty instrument in this age and this hour and this period in Jesus' name.